This is Fresh Tracks Weekly. Unfortunately, we don't have a fishing corner this week because Michael just headed out on a steelhead fishing vacation. So next week's fishing corner should be pretty interesting. For news, it's pretty Montana-centric this week, not gonna lie. So if you don't care about Montana, feel free to skip ahead to the deeper dive where we're gonna talk about shed antler hunting. In Montana last week, people from around the state showed up to the Capitol for the Rally for Public Lands. Uh, the show of force was designed to remind legislators how much Montanans value our public lands and to hold politicians accountable. For a number of reasons, unfortunately, I could not attend the rally this year, but props to everyone who showed up and stood out there in the sub-zero temps uh, to make sure that their voices were heard. A number of speakers rallied the crowd and spoke of why Montanans care so much and love their public lands. On the bright side, the legislative session this year is relatively tame to past sessions. Uh, and this is largely due to groups getting together and hash out their differences beforehand, making sure that they had some common ground and having somewhat of a truce. But there are still a few bills that are less than ideal from the perspective of a public land hunter. So we'll do just a quick little legislative update. There are three separate bills that are seeking to redistribute funds that were originally supposed to go to Habitat Montana. Habitat Montana is a program that directs revenue from hunting license sales to purchase land or conservation easements that will benefit wildlife and their habitat. Uh, it has been a huge conservation tool allowing for the expansion of existing wildlife management areas and purchasing new wildlife management areas as well as countless conservation easements throughout the state. There has been previous attacks on Habitat Montana, one of which has already made it more difficult to approve land and easement purchases. Uh, but these current attack is in the form of these three bills that again are attempting to redistribute funds. This started last year when Montanans voted to legalize recreational use of marijuana with the promise that 20% of the tax revenue would be distributed to Habitat Montana. But naturally when people saw that that number would be in the ballpark of eight to nine million dollars, everyone kind of wanted a piece of the pie and they want to see that money go elsewhere instead of towards conservation. HB 462 would take that money and shift it primarily to law enforcement. SB 442 would shift it to county road maintenance. And HB 669 would primarily shift it into the general fund. Most people don't necessarily have any issues with the programs that they're trying to shift the money to. It's just that Montanans are frustrated because they were promised when they initially voted on this measure that the 20% of the tax revenue would be going towards Habitat Montana. And these bills are taking that for other purposes that they did not vote on. Another thing in the Montana legislature is SB 497. It raised hackles um, of many sportsmen this week as it would have allowed local governments to post prescriptive easements as private property, and if the signage was in place for five or more years, the claim of a prescriptive easement could not be pursued. If you're confused by what I just said, you're not alone, a lot of people were, but luckily Trout Unlimited saw the writing on the wall and they seemed to be the group that rallied the troops and exposed that this bill could likely be used as an abuse of power from local governments to threaten our stream access. But luckily, because of all the input from these groups and the public, this bill is now dead. Another bill, SB 357, has also been stopped. This bill was going after conservation easements, trying to limit the amount of time voluntary conservation easements would be good for. The reason I bring both those bills up that have now been stopped is that we've heard through the grapevine that even though those two bills have been stopped, it's likely not the end of attacks on conservation easements. The United Property Owners of Montana, or UPOM, has been trying hard to chisel away at conservation easements, and this likely isn't the end of it. This is the transmittal week for the Montana legislature, so if I remember correctly, everything needs to be submitted by today, but that doesn't mean that they can't amend bills in the future to add on different things and try to sneak things in at the last second. Again, this was a tactic used in the last legislature. Anyway, there's a number of other bills that have to do with fish and wildlife in Montana. Um, there's some great resources to track these with the Montana Wildlife Federation. They have a section on their website, Montana Free Press, Montana Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. All of these guys have great sections. And Hunt Talk is actually one of the best resources uh, in terms of hunting, fishing, public land issues, legislatively. There's a lot of really smart people on there, so it's a great place to have a discussion and ask questions about these issues, including Randy. Randy is on there very frequently. so. Great place to, to deal with people in the know. And to that, uh, there's a ton of other stuff going on in other states. Hunt Talk, again, great resource, but there's only so much time I have to 
to look into what's going on in, in every state. My wife, Karen, and I ended up at the Montana Wild Sheep Foundation banquet this weekend in Missoula. Uh, the Montana Wild Sheep Foundation is separate from National Wild Sheep Foundation, but they share a very similar mission. Just with Montana Sheep Foundation being a little more Montana-centric, Randy was supposed to talk at the event on Friday, but seeing how he was in the middle of surgery, he missed out. Randy did manage to throw together a last minute video and they were able to share that with the crowd. So that was good. Uh, and then also uh, Montana Wild Sheep announced Ty Stubblefield as their new executive director. So that is very exciting. Ty has been on a number of hunts with us, including this year where he filmed Randy's Uncle Larry on an elk hunt in Arizona. While one of the things that gets people most fired up about this event is that every life member has a chance to win a doll sheep hunt in the Yukon, the most interesting thing to me anyway that happened at this event was what they called the state of the sheep. It was a number of Montana biologists and managers that were gracious enough to show up on a Saturday to present the current status of bighorn sheep across the state. We got an update on a couple of projects that we were lucky enough to film last year. The first of which was a series of transplants from the Missouri River breaks into the Little Belt Mountains. Unfortunately, a significant portion of these sheep have died following the transplants, the majority of which were from mountain lion predation. Also, some have died from pneumonia. Jay Colby, a FWP biologist, did help facilitate some houndsmen and hunters getting access to the area to hopefully take care of some of these problem lions, and hopefully these remaining sheep will stay alive. Um, but another update from a project where they took sheep out of Wild Horse Island is an island in the Flathead Lake and transplanted them into the Tendoy Mountains. And most of these sheep appear to be doing well. I can't remember the exact numbers, but they had good lamb recruitment. The only potential downside of this project was that they seemed to be not utilizing the entire mountain range and sticking to a, a, a relatively small area. It seemed that the rams were starting to explore a little bit, but the ewes and lambs were, were just sticking into some of the smaller chunks of habitat. We got a number of other updates from sheep herds across the state, and also it was really encouraging to hear that they now have a ton of funding in the coming years. I think it was $8 million that they're gonna be allocating towards sheep-related projects over the next five years. And while funding is often an issue and it's really hard to find funding for wildlife research, right now the overarching message was actually for advocacy. They have the money right now, they just need to be able to spend it. So what they need from the public is more advocacy to the legislators and the FWP commission to let them spend the money on good projects. The last thing I need to mention about this event that was really cool was a presentation from Working Dogs for Conservation. And what they've done is train dogs to smell diseased bighorn sheep. They've done a bunch of tests and so far these dogs are able to pick out bighorn and domestic sheep poop from individuals that have been affected with the MOV pathogen, which is the pathogen the most associated with the pneumonia die-offs. Um, so they're able to pick from poop samples. They were able to at least tell this one's diseased, this one's not diseased. They're not sure if they're actually smelling that MOV pathogen or if there's some other factor in it, but they have a very high success rate of identifying which ones are sick. They've also been testing on, on uh, cloth masks where they had sheep breathe into the mask, domestic sheep breathe into the mask, and they were able to detect sheep that were infected versus uninfected. Uh, so they're just starting to test this in a practical sense of um, having bighorns that were captured for a research project, and they're going to have these dogs smell nasal swabs to hopefully identify whether or not the sheep are positive for these pathogens associated with the die-offs. And the reason this is significant is because testing usually takes a significant amount of time, at the very minimum a day to get results back, whereas these dogs are able to provide an instant result. Uh, there is some other stuff with uh, in the field testing that is less accurate that's going on as well. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. Anyway, I could talk about bighorn sheep forever. I used to be a technician that worked on a sheep and goat research project. And also when I was in film school, Pretty much all of my films revolved around bighorn sheep in Montana. Uh, but I'll shut up for now. Sorry that that was a very Montana-centric news segment. And this is what I was excited about this week. We'll have some other stuff next week. But for now, we're going to jump into the deeper dive where we get an update on Randy's arm, how that surgery went, and we'll talk about shed antler hunting and how more and more states are starting to implement different regulations and laws related to shed antler hunting. Randy. Yeah. You have a nice-looking cast there look at that how did it go everybody i can use my trigger finger people were concerned about you i if you didn't notice by last week's video i know i feel bad that everybody <laughs> worried about me but i really appreciate that they did so i just got out of surgery the other day and he obviously 
you, know, you notice how last week these two fingers were just like wrapped around there? I can feel them again. Trust me. And it hurts. <laughs> oh, <dang. laughs> so he got the nerve reconnected and he got these two fingers are working. But the tendon in the wrist, he said, was so shredded that every time he tried to join it, that it would fall apart. And Dang. he said, it's not the end of the world, though, he said, because this tendon that he was trying to reconnect is the one they use as like a donor tendon if they go to graft uh, another tendon somewhere in your hand. Okay. They use this one because it's not as important. So he said, if I behave myself and I do my three months of physical therapy, uh, I should be good to go. I said, well, I got some beaver trapping to do. He's like, <laughs> you aren't doing that. Uh, I said, well, I got some spring bear hunting to do. I said, when's that? I said, late May. He's like, eh, I don't think so. I'm like, I'm a good patient. So. <laughs> I'm going to be just fine. I mean, look at that. So you, you will get most of your mobility back then, it sounds that's, like? That's oh. what he said. He said, if you are really diligent, about physical therapy. I said, Doc, I'm the best patient you are ever going to find. So now I'm just trying to figure out how you put your shirt on when you got this <laughs> big club around there. You walk around, everyone, oh, you know, what can I do for you? Nothing. Get out of my way. <laughs> so that's well, that's the update from a week ago. That's that's good to hear. Yeah. That hopefully. Jace doesn't have to put my, my coat on over my head anymore. And yeah. So making progress. Yeah. And I'm I'm getting to right left handed. Nice. So we're set. We're learning to be learning ambidextrous, to be. right? Yeah, there you the go. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> amphibious. Yeah. <laughs> amphibious, ambidextrous, whatever you want to call it. So I'm I'm doing great. Thanks right. for asking and thanks for everybody who uh who wrote a note of concern. I yeah. uh I'm sure I'll be fine. I, I don't want to see this when they pull it off because, you know, I had this big puncture wound that went in here and came out over here. But now I can feel he did some stuff up here like he threatened that he would have to and some down here. So when I get this thing pulled off, it's probably going to look. You're going to have all sorts of scars in there. Yeah, Monday morning I have my follow-up, what they call it, post-op uh, appointment. Okay. And they'll, I don't know what they'll do, but... Uh, so we'll see. All right. Well, yeah. Spring bear, it's going to be I got the first it. real test, I guess. Yeah. And they told me for three months I can't lift anything over five pounds. And that will be spring bear. So there's probably two camera guys coming on that spring bear hunt. All right. We'll just carry everything for you. Hate, cut up your bear. Hate to be that way, but I might have to pay you to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I think any of us would be happy to. All right. Um, but yeah, for the topic of this week outside of... Here in your update, we're going to talk about shed antler hunting because uh, there's some new stuff in Wyoming. There's some new bills that are currently working through the legislature there that are addressing issues with shed hunting. So it kind of brought back up the topic and it seems like a lot of states are starting to implement rules, regulations, different laws yep. uh, for shed hunting, which is interesting because I feel like, um, I don't know. It's just grown in popularity a ton, so it's obvious that it needs to be addressed. I guess. I, it, I I'm I'm like the contrarian. I I don't pick up shed antlers. I hang them in trees. So this can be a discussion among all of you. Who, yeah. Who so, chase shed antlers? So I I'll start with saying that I do shed antler hunt, mm -hmm. um, and like yeah, I guess like a lot of people probably didn't think a whole lot about it, um, more you know five years ago or so, but it is obvious that it has an impact on the resource. I, I've started to realize that, and you read research articles and, and so forth. But um, So I, I, I'm i conflicted. I, I participate, <laughs> but then also understand the issue. But I'm curious, what does everyone else, do you guys, do you guys shed antler hunt or have thoughts I, on the topic? I also shed hunt. Um, and, yeah, I, I guess a few years ago I, it wasn't much of a thought to me um, in regards to like the whole like winter range, maybe it being a harassment to the wildlife and that sort of thing. But the more I've kind of looked into it and heard stuff about it, it has been something I start started to think about. And I think it is probably something that should be addressed with how many people are out in the woods about about to be this time of year when the animals are most vulnerable. So I think it's something that should be talked about. And 
and in some areas regulated is but i mean i i see both sides of the, um the fence too so i mean if i don't know what we want to get into but well yeah i mean it's really interesting because i think there's the obvious signs when you know if somebody's like driving atvs all over hell chasing elk you know harassing them like that is a very direct visual impact that you can see mm-hmm. versus i imagine people in arizona that might live in an area that has very little snow, very mild winters, like the wildlife have it pretty easy. It's like, what am I doing to impact it? Like, I imagine that perspective is like, yeah, I don't have an impact at all. Right. And so, but it's, there's obviously everything in between those two scenarios and it all is Blake, different. David, David, do you guys ever no, know? No, uh, it's something that I've always kind of wanted to do, but I don't know, like, what the controversies are like what the some of the cons are for it so i am interested in like kind of learning some of that stuff what what you've learned because obviously marcus you probably know more obviously you know more about that than i do so yeah i mean i think the the base of it is wintering wildlife Mm -hmm. it's like the end of winter into the spring is usually the most crucial time of the year for them where they're super vulnerable which is also coincides with when people are starting to go out shed hunting or scouting for shed hunting or just being in the areas that the wildlife are. And I think one of the arguments that shed hunting, a lot of avid shed hunters have is like, well, there's snowmobilers, there's skiers, there's dog walkers, there's all these other people that are out in the hills as well. And they're not wrong. Those people right. are out there. But as a shed antler hunter, if you're good at it, you're going where the wildlife is or, you know, where they were recently at least. And that's, I don't know. It's an interesting topic, but I guess, yeah, Blake, you got anything to, before we dive in further on this? Uh, In terms of shed hunting, I've never really actively sought out a day where I've just gone to the woods and looked for sheds. I kind of stumble upon them when I'm doing other spring activities, turkey hunting or like mushroom hunting. Gotcha. Um, But I kind of wanted to get into Utah and how they've moved their season out and aren't allowing people to start to look for sheds until like May 1st. Is that, is that correct? Right. Yeah. But that w- well, the, this year was an emergency closure in Utah, Utah yep. and they had taken some proactive measures in the past. Like they had shed, you had to take a class, like an online right. class for, for shed hunting to get certified or whatever before I, you could go. I was just reading the Nevada, I just got the book for like the Nevada application process and I was briefly going through there and they had a thing on shed hunting where they have a season, I think, I don't know, May 1st, I believe is their season opener, but I didn't realize they had a certificate. You had to you do obtain a certificate online somewhere before you can actively begin to shed hunt. Right. And is that, I, is there other states that do that as well? No, oh, Utah, oh. Nevada, I don't think, I, Montana and Idaho both currently don't have a lot in terms of like statewide policy right. on wildlife management areas and certain lands there are rules and i'm imagining this certificate is probably a quick little thing online we're telling people like to not harass wildlife during these times right kind of just like a little brief um update in the yeah i think there's a lot of people keep who them do. conscious of what what's going on i think you need to go get your certificate jason report back to us about <laughs> yeah, what yeah. That course well requires. i've taken the utah one just uh-huh. out of curiosity oh, did you? yeah yeah and it's just like it's just kind of your basic right. you know this is a vulnerable time for wildlife please don't harass them what, I, what i've seen uh over this whole utah emergency closure is it seems like a lot of the avid shed hunters are very upset that that they it's that they're kind of the ones singled out and you got right. all the, the dog walkers, the, this, that, and the other running amok in the mountains. And they're a little bit upset that a little bit, they're a very lot. upset. <laughs> they're very upset that these people can go out and do what they like to do. And they, and I mean, they, they make good arguments. They're also playing a role in harassing the wildlife. And I've read somewhere, I think it was Utah DWR, made a statement or something was they don't really have the rain over a lot of those other activities. Right. So they can't necessarily stop them from going out and hiking and doing that. But, um, I think it's a good point, um, that may, I don't know how it would be done, but it'd be nice to also try to educate those other people who are 
super unaware. They have no idea when they're right. going out in the hills with, I've seen a video where there was like a dog walker with tw- 15 dogs all running off leash. Like that's their, their day job or side hobby. They're taking the, the all the neighbor's dogs out for a walk and they're running up the hills, chasing deer all over there and <laughs> stuff like that. It's like, it'd be nice to try to inform the, that crowd. And I don't know how that would be done, but yeah, it's super tough. It's like a very complex issue. Yeah. Yeah. And that's this unfortunate thing where <laughs> there is a little bit of an opportunity to restrict shed antler hunting. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, and like anything, it's not just shed antler hunters that are going to influence wildlife negatively on the winter range. There's a right. million other factors, but it's all those things that add up that eventually cause an animal so much stress that it dies. Yeah. What, what is the substance of, uh, aren't there two or three bills that came through the Wyoming legislature? Yeah. Yeah, and I don't know if you looked into them deeper. I just mostly read that uh, Wildfile article, but let's look. So the one is giving Wyoming residents a head start. So Wyoming already had a uh, regulation that's been in place for quite a while, actually, mm-hmm. and it was ba- anything west of the Continental Divide on Forest Service and might have been any federal land, actually. Yeah, something like forest that. Forest Service for sure. But uh, you couldn't start shed hunting until – a certain date. It's usually like May 5th, May 1st or May 15th. Mm-hmm. And um, anyway, so now they're proposing giving residents of Wyoming a one week head start over non-residents. Cause, uh, and this is like where it kind of blows my mind that there's like a significant, significant amount of people traveling from state to state to shed hunt. And this was Brandy's big point that he brought up um, is when you have Utah having an emergency shed closure and there's so many people who have their flat brims and are super stoked about <laughs> shed hunting. <laughs> they got, they, they will drive 10 hours to another state to go right. shed hunting, Yeah, which I mean, I get it. I, I should, I, I poke fun, but I have driven seven hours on a weekend to go shed antler hunting. So <laughs> I am one of those people, but you're the brim of your, I curve it a little hand. more than, than others, yeah. but other last yeah. year but, I was out in the middle of nowhere and happened to run into Marcus shed hunting. No kidding. Not even in a vehicle. <laughs> we like were, uh, we, a couple we miles were, off the road. We no both run into each other out in the middle of nowhere. Like, uh, that was uh, pretty funny. Uh, you know? uh, Did you find so any good sheds? Here's an interesting, really. interesting <laughs> one for Wyoming is, you know, the elk refuge in Jackson. Yeah. If you've ever been there or seen video of what that rodeo is, there yep. are people who come from all over the Rockies and it's like the Oklahoma land rush of people going out there. The majority of them are not Wyoming residents. Yeah. So you give Wyoming residents a weak head start on that elk refuge in Jackson. Oh, there's nothing left. Yeah. <laughs> no. So, so I did participate in that one year. Oh, you did. And I was mostly wanted to watch what happened. And so it was the first year. It used to be like an 8 a.m. opening. Yeah. There, there, it was like a weird scenario because they would open it at midnight from the Forest Service side. And so people would be crossing this river and going through sketchy like yeah. rocks and stuff to get there for the 8 a.m. open when the because the forest would open at midnight. The refuge would open at, okay. at 8 a.m. So they had an eight hour trek or whatever to get to be on the boundary it was a nightmare so they made it the same so th- but they went with midnight and so then they opened it at midnight and so everyone's got their headlamps and spotlights and there's horses and people running up the hills and we actually went back and on the highway and just watched from the highway and i actually i have a time lapse somewhere i'll see if i can find it <laughs> up in this video. i just took like a time lapse of all these lights going up on the hills and like our our thought process is like we'll go we'll go look for sheds, but we'll wait out till everyone has it out of their system and go, uh, you know, once it's daylight. And we didn't find a single thing. Like really? we saw a lot of shed antlers in the back of pickups and <laughs> deadheads and everything. And like we didn't see, we didn't find anything. Wow, it was pretty funny, huh? Well, oh no, it, I take that back. I found one spike elk horn. That okay, was, that was like in a bush. But isn't one of the <laughs> Wyoming bills also to? have like a license like a 25 dollar license yep. or something yep yeah for at least for non-residents um sounds like and these are still like no, i don't think you, any of this has passed at least not to my uh, knowledge but that's what's currently being proposed yeah so i mean i makes sense to me because i yeah the license could also serve as like you have to go through your education yeah you'll learn about shed hunting 
and or you know about the impacts that you can have on the resource and mm -hmm. i don't know i feel like most people who are into it a lot like have a decent understanding of it yeah and this is one where it's like interesting for me to think about because i try to be cognizant of it of not pressuring wildlife when i'm out there mm -hmm. but i still know that i end up pressuring wildlife at times and it's just like you can try to wait like i'm gonna wait until there's nothing in the area i'm gonna wait till that you know you're watching two bulls or whatever and you wait till they go into the next drainage but then you go over there and then you happen to push out a herd of mule deer that you didn't even know about in the bottom you know different species that you weren't even thinking about but mule deer are often the ones even struggling more than right. the elk and so it's just like all those little things add up but huh. um I yeah mean, it's interesting i i just what? wonder with like the domino effect so utah has an emergency closure nevada has a season wyoming has a season does that mean all the people who had went to those states are now going to go to arizona and new mexico and colorado or are they going to come up to montana and idaho what i mean these people are crazy fanatics about it right so I think we're kidding ourselves if we think they're just going to say, well, this year I'm just going to stay home. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that we talked about in the episode last year was the fact that, you know, it's hard to determine how much of the demand is coming from the fact that shed antlers are worth a lot of money. Yeah. Because they are. Like, I don't know what the going rate is right now, but you find a big six-point elk shed, you get $200, $250 for it. And so – that is significant like and that's that's just like if you're only selling on weight if you find something like unique and significant that somebody wants for like an art piece or whatever mm -hmm. you could probably sell it for a lot more really and so uh, yeah that was like what we we talked about last year it's like well what if you made it illegal to sell it similar to that of wild game meat because that's a long standing you know part of the north american model we had yeah. you don't sell mm -hmm. game meat in markets but when it comes to antlers and fur, it, those are allowed to be sold. And fur has like a long, I mean, there's a long tradition and a whole nother culture and trapping and reasons why it's legal to sell furs. But I don't think people really thought about antlers. I mean, until probably, the, I don't know, maybe the last 15 years. Yeah. I don't know. But it's, yeah. Hmm. So I think the hypothetical question is if you made it, illegal to sell them then would that have would that help out with this crazy demand but i don't know if it would anymore i think it would maybe chip off a couple like a, a, a little very bit. small portion maybe but i think the majority of the the hardcore shit hunters they do it because they they like collecting them they like finding them they like like their their end goal isn't to make become be rich or make a living off finding shit antlers it's just the per passion of pursuing that right. is but, my opinion well and then you also have the added uh thing of not only so it's like you sell the antlers like that's like the direct thing that you could monetize right but now you have people that are monetizing social media and youtube and whatever and so it's like in the same i mean not that differently from what we do honestly like hunting right yeah. on youtube so people go out and they film their shed antler hunting and they I and they it. like they gain <laughs> followers and people think it's cool to see them out in the yeah. bout and, and so it's just like this other form of monetization of shant antlers or even mm -hmm. even if it's your ego <clears throat> that you're inflating not not your wallet <laughs> it's just like a it's like a super like, a couple of years ago i seen and this was kind of a combo of your quote unquote influencer and selling the antlers there i seen some people who have a decent following really into shed hunting they were putting a single antler they'd autograph it and put it on ebay and people were bidding like i can't remember but it was 100 a single antler were going for hundreds of dollars i don't know if they this was a sustainable thing and they kept doing mm -hmm. it but they did a few of them and i was like this is so bizarre <laughs> I, i'm just too old for this stuff you don't want to be a <laughs> professional shed antler hunter no i i I am not going to pack an elk out. I want, even when I find them out hunting, I'm not going to pack them out of the woods. I hang them in the trees. Yeah, so we need to hear the Randy Newberg yeah. philosophy on shed antler hunting. So well, let's, it's let's just, it. it's mine. You know, yeah, it's no, not, I'm not saying it's right. But so I grew up 
uh, there's two reservations near where I grew up and some of the tribal members came to school with us and I got to be friends with quite a few of them. And one of them would tag along with me hunting and he didn't hunt at all. But if we found back there, there's a white tails, right? If you found a little white tail antler, he'd hang it up in the tree and he's like, we're going to have good luck today. And so I just kept hanging them in trees. That's what I still do. And I think I am when I do it. So that's why I tell you guys, you take that out of that tree and you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> well, has, I, it, has it brought you any good luck? I don't know. <laughs> makes, makes me think about him. Yeah. He's, he's no longer with us and it makes me think about him and I feel good for yeah. a while. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's cool. I, I have since, since learning about this, hung some shed antlers in trees. I haven't hung a lot of like really nice brown <laughs> shed antlers in trees, but I have hung some shed antlers in trees. And, uh, oh. Oh. Solidarity with... Yeah. That that message. No, okay. Not all of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's this, it'll be interesting to see. I think it's the writing on the wall that other states are going to start implementing yeah. uh, regulations. Mm-hmm. And so, I, I don't know, I guess as they're doing that, it'll be interesting to, to try to educate ourselves and, and help steer it to something that actually makes sense. And like, and like you said, it's, there are a lot of other people. There's like so much winter recreation and spring recreation that also impacts wildlife. And it's like, how do we address that at the same time? I, I don't know. I really like, at least in Montana, we have the WMAs where they're completely closed to all recreation. I mean, granted, those are just smaller portions. But I think that's a pretty good model. Yeah. Um, in the sense, I mean... Nobody can go out there. Not hikers, not nobody. Yeah, not so anybody. And it, I mean, it really gives the animals their peace, right? For that allotted time. That I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't, don't know, know how other states could adopt that. I and, think the the best but, example was Wyoming, where yeah. they did shut down all Forest Service land right. until May first, and that's. But again, that's shed antler hunting, so they still have backcountry skiers and yeah. and other people out there. But um, th- yeah, so. I don't know. Do you, uh, Randy might know on federal land, like it'd be, you'd be poking a big bear if you said, if you tried to close down like a big chunk of national forest. I mean, like, I just don't see well, it happening, right? I, I mean, I, well, I don't during either. the COVID era, I know Washington, I don't, there might have been a few other states, but they were closing down national forest. Really? Just because they didn't want people out and about and contacting with each other. Yeah, and that was such a weird time. Um, so, look back on that. Yeah, yeah when all that yeah, was yeah, that was on. a very different yeah circumstance. I, but it, I, I, I guess think you a, could say it's happened. Yeah, I think a state would have a hard time closing down federal lands. Yeah. Right. If, even well, a federal, I mean, it would have to if be a, a federal, cooperative yeah, effort. Even if a federal you, agency said we're going to close down this big mountain range, it just you know you're going to gore somebody's ox who knows a senator or knows a congressman and it's just going to be a, a big stink so yeah no I, there's no good answer i think it's it is it, it but to recognize that there is an impact i think that's one thing right. that some people are unwilling to admit it mm-hmm. and it's like no yeah. like right. you got to think about the big picture and there is an impact by you being out there whether it's backcountry skiing walking your dog Yep. Shed antler hunting. And to think that shed antler hunting is like the same, it's not. Right. I, <coughs> I, I get it that, you know, like you, the examples you said, you see those things with the dogs chasing deer. Like that is not good. But when you're shed antler hunting, you are going exactly where the wildlife yeah. is. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know. It's yeah. it's a tough one. Like I'll be thinking about it as I start going shed hunting, <laughs> hunting here in the next month. Uh, I just, when there's walleyes to catch and beaver to trap, yeah, there's no way you're going to get me to go look for some antlers that fell off some <laughs> animal's head. And I just, oh, well, I'm, I'm glad you guys do it. I mean, I get it, but it's not my gig. Yeah, it's just a fun way to get out in the spring, and you, you do learn a lot. You find, I mean... It's a way to scout for hunting in a, in a way. Obviously, the animals are in different locations a lot of the time, but you just learn the roads, you see different landscapes, and mm-hmm. figure out like start to figure out the big picture of like where those elk were in the summer, and then the hunting season, and where they winter. And it's just kind of fun to like be out there at all times of the year. But yeah, well, all I can say is if you guys are out there. Use discretion. 
Exactly. And I think that's the big message of why these the legislation seldom pops up without being a response to something. Right. And the response is, hey, this is a critical time. We we need to do the things we can manage. Yeah, we can't manage all those things Jace was talking about, but the things we can, we it's our job to to manage them to the benefit of wildlife. But I think education usually goes further than legislation. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think a lot of times people like to be rewarded for doing the right thing versus punished for doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have any? I'm curious what you guys have been quiet. No, it's just interesting absorbing the information here. Because like I said, I, you know, always looked fun, but I I guess I didn't think about or, you know, understand the, the consequences too much of like what being out in the landscape was doing to some of the wildlife and what that could do to them. So, yeah. yeah. And I feel like we're running out of time, but mm-hmm. I, it, that, it is hard to articulate it. Mm-hmm. That like that makes sense. You spooking a yeah. doe mule deer 200 yards. It's like, okay, I did, I didn't just kill that deer, but it's, it's like all of those things add up. Yeah. And this one, you have a bunch of people out on the landscape. It's just those repeated disturbances over and over and over uh-huh. again. And it's just like they're in such weak condition. Like they are living on reserves at that time of year. Uh-huh. Yeah. And again, other other areas where it's not as much snowpack and they have better forage quality, it probably isn't that much of an right. issue. Mm-hmm. But when you do, and like even, even after the snow melts, so it's like if they had a tough winter, you might look at the landscape and they're eating green grass and they have great forage, but they're in such poor condition yeah. that they're just like, they're screwed if they get any more pressure, mm-hmm. you know, they're, yeah. But anyway, we're a little over our time limit, so we'll wrap it up. It's an interesting topic. Yeah. So, but yeah, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thanks for doing it. All right. <laughs>